New Buddha Way Dhamma Talks. Jeff Hunt presents a talk on some aspect of the Buddha's teaching. See you all again. And um, as you know, we always deal with key ideas in the Buddha's teaching connected with how we actually live. It's not an academic exercise. The more you attend these talks, the more you practice, the more you participate in the Sangha's activities, the more it will all start to fit together in one alternative view of our reality. It's very important. At the beginning, you may think, oh, well, there are all these different interesting talks, and that's interesting, and that's interesting, there's compassion, and there's equanimity, etc., etc. And it might seem rather fragmented, but because it's uh, such a far-reaching change in our perception of things, uh, we can't throw everything at once at you. We have to hope that you will come regularly and discuss with uh, other participants. <clears throat> and over a period of time, and if you're brand new, I would say probably a year, then it will all start to fit together. And you will find it quite easy to think in a more peaceful, fruitful, and happier way. So it takes time, so we have to make connections. Now today I'm going to talk about um, altruistic joy, and you might think, right, <laughs> actually it's very intimately connected with the other things that you've already heard. <clears throat> now altruistic, altruistic is not a word that we use <clears throat> a lot these days, <clears throat> altruistic, altru, from, you know, same, same uh, root as um, alternative, alt, the other. So altruistic joy means joy in the other, and what the other is achieving, attaining, doing, joy in the joy of others, if you like, participating in the joy of others. So what it's not is joy in one's own attainments or benefits or whatever. Not that there's anything necessarily wrong with that at all. But that's not where the emphasis is. Because we quite naturally tend to be self-centered. So we don't need to teach people self-centeredness. That's where we are. And that's part of our problem, according to the Buddha anyway. Of course, you can challenge that and discuss that. So we, we need to put the emphasis on shifting everything towards otherness, if you like, and togetherness. Now what is human, humanity, what's good for the human race, not just for us as individuals. That is not to say that we're going to abandon concern for the individual. It's a matter of, well, to use another big word, a dialectic between the one and the many. Now, the word in Pali is mudita, 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 meaning, let's make it a bit simpler, selfless or unselfish joy. That is being elated at somebody else's development or growth or attainment with the warning that we still have to think about whether it's harm harmful or not. So, you know, we feel this quite naturally often, for example, in, with our family or friends. If your child or grandchild uh, is really happy over something, then you will naturally start to feel happy as well. You're happy over their happiness. Now, if there are a lot more of that in the world and we could expand it uh, from the family and friendships to how we feel about humanity, which is a pretty big call, I must say. Um, still, this would be a better world than it is. At the moment, it's dangerously close to taking very much the wrong path, which we have as a human race lived through before, 
in absolutely horrendous fashion. We don't want to go in that direction, but it looks as though we are going in that direction at the moment. So let's develop the otherness and perhaps uh, subdue or quieten the self-centeredness. We don't have to do that, anything about that's already there, but we have to be aware of it. Okay, so let's work with the idea of unselfish joy or selfless joy, mudita, altruistic joy. So if you do have someone that you love, and you almost certainly do, when they are happy, you probably feel happy too. That gives you a taste of what we're talking about here. Now, a framework in the Buddhist teachings is always there in the background. And I don't want to bamboozle you with technical terms. There's a difference between dualism and, and non-duality. Now, with duality, it means that we always think of me first and the rest of it is out there for me to manipulate, basically. So it's me and the world, two things. Non-duality says, oh, oh, no, 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 that's the wrong way of looking at things. That's delusional. You are embedded in the world. You are the world. You are nature. You're not separate from each other or from anything. You're a drop in the ocean. Okay. Now, how do we apply that to mudita? Well, we see immediately that it's non-dual thinking because the joy that I'm feeling is that of someone else's benefit or development or whatever. So the emphasis is on the relationship between me and that other person. Non-duality, not two-ness, but togetherness or unity. So again, go back to, perhaps you've got a small, a small child around. When they're full of joy over something, it's because it's your child, right? That you will automatically feel that. And that is kind of non-dual. It's about the relationship. It's not about me feeling better or even the child feeling better. It's about us feeling better about something together, enjoying it together. And that's the whole idea, by the way, of the Sangha, of having a Sangha or a group such as us, which is uh, ours, which is open, which is free. It's not based on mem membership. It's not based on money. It's just we are where we want to be because we are getting something, if you like, out of it in our understanding. We don't make any money out of it, that's for sure. But our understanding is developing. Our happiness, wisdom, patience, courage are developing. These are, in truth, the most important things in life. And it's sometimes very much too late when we realize that. So um, we can say that the joy we're talking about is non-dual joy. It's not about, for example, my having benefited by having got something from somebody. It's rather my feeling good about sharing something with somebody. If we, lo if we lose sense of that, we've lost everything. There's nothing left really except to live, get as much as you can, and then die. <laughs> Doesn't sound too good to me, right? Okay, so there is a phrase, you see, this is what I said right at the beginning, that, you know, everything in the Buddhist teaching fits in to a big jigsaw puzzle of one picture. So, and what holds that, how that picture together? We call non-duality, but we will, we'll go into that in greater detail in our root session, which is a session for those people who've been coming for a year or more. And we'll make announcements about that later on. Now, what is the opposite then of uh, mudita? What would be the opposite of it? Because thinking in terms of opposites is sometimes quite helpful in throwing light on what it is we want to understand. Well, if joy is some sort of pleasure or el elation, then the opposite must be displeasure, suffering. It could also, of course, be jealousy. When somebody has got something I'd like to have, 
the opposite of altruism is my actually feeling bad about it. We all know what that is. But you see, the, well, the reason that the path of the Buddha is a little bit difficult for us is that we have to be honest about ourselves. It's the only way we can move forward is to see into ourselves and say, okay, yeah, I was feeling a bit jealous about that. Uh, I'm going to be more aware of that happening again. And I don't penalize myself for that because I'm human. That's how we are, we humans. But now I'm aware of it. And that makes a big difference, the fact that I'm aware of it. This pleasure, suffering, jealousy. We, of course, know that people, sometimes, some people, us, maybe me, you, sometimes we'll even sabotage somebody else's work because they're getting on too well. I've seen that happen um, in the workplace where a document has been hidden or something just to, to sabotage the achievements of somebody else. I mean, it's, it's not very pleasant, but there it is. Now, um, it's a better world if we can minimize, you know, I, I don't know whether we can ever eradicate it, but if we can minimize it, that would be a good thing. If we can become aware of it as a human trait, that would be a good thing. There is also a word which we may never have heard of, Schadenfreude, which, I probably pronounced wrongly, but it's German, meaning getting pleasure out of somebody else's failure, which you sometimes see as well. But I think we've all seen that. And sometimes maybe secretly we do feel a little bit of that with somebody we don't like. And there they are being successful again, and then you think, you know, you don't feel good about that. That's Schadenfreude. We don't use that very, but it's just looking into, you know, the way we are, honestly. Of course, we are full of good things as well, because without the potential for good, there wouldn't be any point in talking about this. There's good there. We all know that we can be, uh, we can express mudita. We can, and we do. We just want to move more in that direction and apply it and understand it. And be aware of what is going on in our own minds. This is a very important issue, I think, this and many of the issues we've been talking about for this, the um, point in history that we are at at the moment, which is very unstable and can go one way or another. We have to honestly ask ourselves, do we in the Western world now live in an unsustainable culture of enjoyment? Is that what life is about? As many holidays as possible, for example? As many um, parties drenched in alcohol as possible? Um, all the things that we do to keep ourselves occupied with joy and happiness. But now we've got to go back to what we mean by joy and happiness. Is this momentary, we're talking about a momentary joy which is you know it's over and then what i'm thinking is how can i how can we do that again so if i already come home from holiday and i'm thinking about what i'm going to do next holiday because i'd like my really like my life to be full of holidays now this is actually delusional <laughs> sorry to say this and you can just say i'm a mad hat if you like but but it's unsustainable and we can see now that it's unsustainable how many aeroplanes, for example, can, this, can the atmosphere actually hold without doing tremendous damage? Not to pick on aeroplanes, aeroplanes are not the only problem. We've got lots and lots of problems because we're not thinking big enough. We're not joining up the dots like we should. If we were to give a new word to capture the truth about the Western world, I think it's a bit more like, um, or we, we, perhaps we could call it fun land, fun. If you listen carefully, the word fun is used so, so much in our vocabulary because actually it's a root basis of what makes life, or what we try to make life uh, meaningful about is through fun. And if, if I don't have fun for a day or two, then I start getting miserable. 
Other people are having fun and I'm not. What's the matter with me? Well, there's a much deeper way of being contented uh, about life than simply a series of fun events. We need a lot of thinking and a lot of collective thinking to shift in that direction. I think we can see now that the multiple crises we have with the pandemic, with the edge of financial crisis, with possible economic recession, we're probably already into that, with climate change, devastating forest fires, uh, all, all of that, all put it all together, and inequality on a huge scale. And we're teetering on the edge, not just economically and politically, but actually morally. This is a real test for us. Are we going to slip into hatred again and blame somebody else and want to beat them up? Unfortunately, that is an option that is open to us. But are we really that stupid a second or third hundredth time? Or is this going to be different? Are we going to learn from this? That there are some ways you cannot go. You've reached the limit. That doesn't mean we're abolishing fun. We just mean we are putting it in its proper place. So for this to happen, we need mindfulness. Mindfulness is self-knowledge, self-examination, that you become, uh, what, trying to simplify it for you, is being aware of one's own states of mind. So not just directly living out a state of mind through reactions or copying others, but turning the mind around, reflection or reflexive. What is it that I'm feeling now? And is this what are, the, what are the implications of it? Is it something fruitful and beneficial or is it something unfruitful and harmful? Surely we can do this. And we are, well, we are doing it. You know, it's been, a, the idea has been around for a long time, not, and not only in Buddhism. It's very strong in Buddhism. It does seem overwhelming, I admit. The reason it seems overwhelming is part of the problem. Because we are self-centered, when we think of what, what I'm now telling you, we think, I can't possibly do anything to help. Do you see how that thinking itself follows from self-centeredness? Because I'm thinking about me. But we, join up the, the means and get a big we, <laughs> then there are chances of things moving in uh, a better direction or in a non-delusional uh, direction, one in which we recognize the limits of human life. You can't be happy by, by ignoring them. If you keep going through red traffic lights, sooner or later you're going to hit a truck. And we are going through red traffic lights. The, the traffic lights are there not to make us miserable, but to give us a warning and say, no, you can't, you've got to stop here. There are plenty other places to go, or you just wait, but you can't just dash through a red traffic light without taking huge risks. Okay. Enjoyable. And something is enjoyable. Now, this can cause a lot of confusion as well. Being the way we are, for example, we will take the view that a meditation retreat or session is enjoyable. Now, when you think about that, that's a little bit strange. Something being enjoyable is not a measure of whether it's right or wrong. It could be enjoyable, but wrong. It could be enjoyable, but self-destructive. So, enjoyable, yes, but enjoy, good, enjoyable. Enjoyable for the good would be a different view of things from, different from what, what, we, what is the dominant view th these days. 
So enjoyable is not always a measure of what is right and good. We have to join, join up the dots again. Okay, so how does one practice mudita? How does one practice altruistic joy? Well, as you might guess by now, if you're, you know, coming to these talks, coming to these, to the practice, and I hope soon we'll be together again in, in, our, in our sessions. Um, chanting, for example, is a good thing that we do, and we can chant the Metta Sutta. And we have been, those of you who've been coming for a long time know that we, at least in Woking, we do chant the Metta Sutta, which is a reminder of the direction we should be going in. Let me just give you a flavor of the Metta Sutta that we chant together. So with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards towards the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, sitting or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. Having a, 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 an attitude of goodwill. And when you bump into difficulties and bump into nastiness, take the attitude, well, this is something for me to learn from. How am I going to respond? Am I going to respond on the basis of what I know about we human beings? Or am I going to react because it's an insult to me? There are 8 billion of us. How important can I be? Well, I am important. We are all, each of us, equally important. But there are quite a lot of us right now. So chanting anyway is, is one, one way of building up a, a, ch a change in, in attitude. Mindfulness, being aware of one's responses to others of the pleasurable and unpleasurable states in one's own reactions. When somebody tells me, oh, I've just got my PhD or I've just, um, you know, won a, in a tennis tournament or uh, I've read such and such a book that I always wanted to read and it's made so much difference to me. You know, how do you feel about them telling you that? You think, good, that's good. Yeah, maybe I should do that too. Or something like it, well done. And feel it, not say it hypocritically, right? So there are many, many, many opportunities in which, in other words, you can be congratulatory. Congratulation, isn't that a, isn't that a good word? There was even a song that won the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> Congratulations. Right? It was a different time, 1970s, I think. I don't think the song, a song called Congratulations would win any, any prizes these days. We are losing a lot of our moral concepts. They're dropping out of our language. Very, very, very strange but dangerous phenomenon. Remember to congratulate what is done for the good, right? But not in a patronizing way. You don't go around patting people on the head, of course. But it's part of the non-duality is that you're just joining in, in the, the joy with someone, someone else. It's, 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 a, it's a joint joy, if you like. Okay, um, we're going to stop soon. Um, I'd like to finish with a quotation always before we go back to the key point. We go back to what the, the Buddha was teaching. The Buddha said, here a disciple lets his mind, his or her mind, pervade one quarter of the world with thoughts of unselfish joy. And so the second, the second quarter, and so the third quarter, and so the fourth quarter. And thus the whole wide world, above, below, around, everywhere, and equally. He or she continues to pervade with a heart of unselfish joy, abundant, grown great, measureless, without hostility or ill will. That is obviously an ideal. It is something to work towards. 
And the more, more we go in that direction, the better we feel about it and the better the world will be for all of us. So to finish with a key point. What's the key point? Key point, selfish joy tends to stray from the path. So it's joy about me and my attainments. That is a tendency to move away from the path that we're trying to follow. Unselfish or congratulatory joy follows the path. That is where the path is. That is the way that we go. So I will leave it there and look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you very much. New Buddha way lets go of east and west and starts afresh in the life we have now. For more information, visit www.newbuddhaway.org.